Hello and welcome back to yet again another EDH deck tech video. I am moving away from my more casual decks and going to my main collection, my main staple decks. And this is my current Grixis, uh, kind of a 1v1 ish deck. This is my Kess Paradox Engine deck. Uh, Kess Descendant Mage is a pretty new threat to the uh, competitive environment. I mean, she's just a very scary contender when it comes to any kind of uh, Grixis controlish deck or any high tide variant or turns combo deck. Um, when I saw her, I loved the fact that she was able to do so much with the graveyard, although it does kind of irritate me uh, that they did have a creature, a, a character on the shard of Grixis, um, the human. I can't remember her name, but uh, she was someone who fought Cedrus, the Traitor King, on the Shard of Grixis in that storyline. The human, the uh, last human necromancer, uh, not not a dead zombie, whatever. They already had a character, uh, but they created a new human on the Shard of Grixis for to just plug in here. It seems kind of like development forgot. Maybe someone already existed, but whatever. Anyways. Cast Descendant Mage is a fairly broken commander and a 4 drop 3 4 flying. Seems okay. Uh, her ability, although, says on my turn I can cast a card from my graveyard as it were my hand. Uh, not quite flashback. Something with buyback, for example, I can still pay the buyback to put the card into my hand. So if you have her out and you time warp, that means next turn you can time warp again. Kind of broken. My deck doesn't do that though. My deck is built around Paradox Engine. Um, which is this card. Paradox Engine is another fairly broken card. It's a 5 mana costing legendary artifact. Whenever I cast a spell, I untap all my non-land permanents. The goal of this deck is just to put out a bunch of mana rocks, then put Paradox Engine into play, and try to win the game from there. Kess does enable this because she helps us get a bunch of recursion from the spells we've used earlier to help Cantrip and Tutor. Um, Kess is who I use when there is one opponent. I do like playing this deck against multiple opponents, so I always bring out my favorite Grixis commander to date, Gwendolyn de Corsi. Uh, she's a 4 mana, 3 5. I can tap only on my turn to make an opponent discard a card at random. She is actually very good with Paradox Engine. She herself becomes a part of the combo because I can start wrecking everyone's hands. Although that's a bit of a win more, really, for what this deck is trying to do. Kess is the intended general. So, with Paradox Engine out and like a plethora of mana rocks, the deck has a few ways of winning. Um, primarily, it's a buyback card. Some card that I can use to buy back and I just create a game winning state. Uh, for example, if I had six mana from my mana rocks, two being blue, I can bounce every permanent because I'll just be able to cast this infinitely. I could burn if I had five mana, one being red. I could draw my entire deck, thus getting one of these other cards and all my mana rocks if I had six mana, one being blue. Those are the win conditions for the deck, but uh, let's go through the rest so you guys kind of know what's going on here. Let's say Kess over here. The creature package is very small. The deck is basically a Grixis control shell combo deck. So anything, there's not room for excess, like excess good stuff. The best we can really fit in here is the, the the best cards we can to survive with. Gilded Drake, for example, we can take out an aggro commander and take it for ourselves. Bell for Strix can ward off aggro and it replaces itself. We have a Rapper Snapper just because we need to rebuy a lot of spells in our graveyard sometimes and Kess isn't always around. We have a Trophy Mage. Another alternate way this deck can try to go off is with the Staff of Domination. So she can tutor up Staff of Domination. Or she can just get like a chromatic lantern or whatever I need to fix my mana rocks. Because that's the core of the deck is it needs a high volume of mana rocks. We have a trinket mage to help us start tutoring. It can go get us this whole ring, mana crypt, whatever we need. Chrome mox, for example, to give us a color. We have a Frexian metamorph. We can use this to copy a meta, uh, basically a mana rock we already have. Yeah, we could do this to clone someone's cheeky creature. This is mainly here so we can copy like a Gilded Lotus. That's it for creatures. There's not any other creatures. Let's go through the spells, the biggest chunk of the deck. <laughs> As I said, these are the ideal ways the deck tries to win the game with. By drawing our entire deck, by burning out every opponent, poking them to death by one damage, 
or by bouncing every permanent into play back into their hands. Uh, the capsize is the obnoxious one because again if I am playing with Gwendolyn instead of Kess, I can then make them discard their entire hand. It, it, it prompts a concession, essentially. Then we have all sorts of tutors and good stuff, control, whatnot we can to get us to that point in the game. Mystical Tutor is typically used to either get a draw effect, a hard tutor, or maybe Whir of Invention, which is ideal for putting the Paradox Engine straight into play. We have Vamp Toot because we need those tutors. <laughs> Same thing with Demonic and a Dark Petition. We have Intuition, because we like having some things specifically in our graveyard. This is fantastic with Kess as the commander, because that essentially becomes a tutor for three cards. Like, I could tutor for literally anything I need with Kess to then just rebuy it. We have Fabricate. This is going to go help us get whatever mana rock we need or the Paradox Engine. And War of Invention being the best tutor in the deck, because... If it's allowed to resolve, it literally puts Paradox Engine straight into play. War for 5 is the ideal end of turn, untap and we win, kind of thing. We do have a Brainstorm for some card filtering. We need a Ponder in here. The deck is, in my opinion, I'm missing about 5 cards I need to get, and I'll point them out as I go. Ponder is one card that would be ideal here. We have a Frantic Search, Impulse. These are just ideal instant speed, draw, loots, whatnot, whatever we can do to get digger, dig deeper into our deck looking for combo parts and or mana rocks. We have a Time Twister. Ideally, we don't want to get rid of our graveyard if we're using Kess, but sometimes we need to draw seven. Sometimes we need to draw seven. Ad Nauseam is here. Uh, we do have some high-end mana rocks, a five drop in Paradox Engine, a five drop in the Guild of Lotus. We have a six drop in Time Spiral, uh, but really most of our deck is three or less. Uh, so Ad Nauseam is here, so we can end of turn just draw real hard, real fast, and hopefully we get there. We have a Paradoxical Outcome. This card is fun. I like this card, and especially in vintage decks where you're trying to build up your storm, and you just bounce all your mocks and you replay everything, you just, it's fantastic. Essentially with the Paradox Engine and like two mana rocks out, we can pick up our rocks, draw two, or whatever we need. If we have a bunch of mana rocks out, this is basically going to draw us all the cards we need to then recast the mana rocks and just keep on building up extra mana and all the cards. Very good card. We have a stroke as an instant speed draw, so we can in a turn just try to refill our hand after we dump a bunch of mana rocks. And the time spiral, which is another refill. Now we have a few controlish spells here. We do have an unsubstantiate. This is a pet favorite card. Ideally, you just want better permission, like a Pact of Negation, for example, so you can hopefully finish your turn while you're trying to combo off, but I just, I like this card. We have a Delay, another two-drop counterspell, and actual factual counterspell, and a Cryptic Command. Then we have some Thought Seeds. This is in here kind of as a placeholder. Uh, I am trying to bend this to be more multiplayer instead of 1v1, so something like Thought Seeds is not as ideal. Um, a better alternative here would just be another Permission spell, another counterspell. We have Vandal Blast to help blow out their starts. Dreadbore as a target removal. This could be a Terminate, but the Planeswalker option is why it's still here. I'm thinking this is probably going to be changed into Terminate. We have a Lightning Bolt. Uh, these are super cheap utility spells. Um, why these are here, again, is because if Paradox Engine is out, I sometimes need to actually build extra mana. So by casting a 1-2 to two drop spell, I'm untapping uh, multiple mana rocks. And then I can then save up that mana to cast a bigger spell. For example, if I just want to chain together a bunch of weak, tiny 1-2 to two mana spells and I build up like 3 mana per spell, then I can eventually dump all that into a Stroke of Genius. Um, again, how that works, I'll get to it when we get to the mana rocks, but if I find a way of refilling my hand and I just have like 2 or 3 mana rocks out, if I'm drawing more mana rocks, I could then cast those mana rocks to untap and continue filling up my hand, continue playing more mana rocks, and it starts essentially getting out of hand. That's why there's like a lot of cheap shit in here. Again, why cast is good too. Rift is ideal. We have a Toxic Deluge for removal, a Damnation for mass removal, a Bribery. Uh, this is more of a uh, 
that stall mechanic, I suppose. This is not going to go get me some game ending effect. This is more or less a bait spell. Something to dirtle around with while we're resolving early mana rocks. Something like this can come out fast and early and it requires them to remove it before I gain some kind of advantage. And a Yagwo. Uh, this is, in short, a combo deck. The combination is with Paradox Engine. It's going to get blown up at some point in time. We can use this to rebuy it if we don't have like a time twist or reshuffle. Uh, of course, if the Paradox Engine gets exiled, we don't actually have a good way of winning the game other than just beating face with Kess. <laughs> Oops, come back here. Now, there's a few permanents in here before we get to the artifacts. I have two Planeswalkers. Dak Faden is a temporary placeholder. Again, this is moving from 1v1 to multiplayer. Dak is fantastic in 1v1. He steals the opponent's mana rocks, which is essentially the win condition for the deck. Um, the draw and discard is also very good, but in multiplayer, um, he's going to basically hate everyone sees the expensive card and they want to destroy it. Tezzeret, although, is kind of necessary. He's going to stay. He can negative to go get me like a chromatic lantern immediately, negative zero to get a mana crypt. I can, if I plus him and he survives a turn, I can go get Paradox Engine straight into play. So he is ideally the best Planeswalker for the deck. And uh, recently, I have been adjusting most of my EDH decks to run one single Planeswalker for my own personal reasons. Uh, the exception, of course, is my Mono Red deck or a Planeswalker-based deck. Tezzeret is the Planeswalker for this deck. We have a copy artifact. The Paradox Engine is legendary, so it's not smart to copy it. But this is a two-mana Get a Lotus, for example. Um, or whatever artifact the opponents may have. It's a nice jump start. Again, another two mana costing cheap spell to help build out more mana while building up that paradox turn. And finally, we have a treachery. Similar to bribery, this is a bait. This is essentially a mid to early game nuisance uh, to delay whatever the opponents are doing until I can create a better setup for myself. Let's go through the bread and butter of the deck. That is the actual act like artifact junk. So, Paradox Engine. The card is dumb. Um, I don't think this is ban worthy. I mean, in the current EDH environment, Protean Hawk is reigning supreme in competitive groups. Storm is much stronger than this. Uh, the deck doesn't have enough permission to really guarantee this or lock it or cover it from exile. I'm not playing green, no Rift Sweeper. So, I don't think Paradox Engine is a broken card. This is definitely not something like ban worthy. It's a strong card for sure, though. So five mana, just whenever I cast a spell, untap all my non-land permanents. Um, commonly seen with Wizard Tribal, if you're playing like a zombie, Wizard of Scrolls. Uh, the basis for this deck, where I first started building this, I was actually playing Anala, Wizard Tribal. And the way the deck ran was with a zombie and Laboratory Maniac trying to deck myself. That is literally the original basis for this deck that started when the Anala deck came out and Literally, that was week one of Anala, and this is the current status of that deck. Uh, I still have Anala, by the way. I'll get that video shortly. <laughs> Since A's top is generically good here, I can stack the trigger when I tap it to draw a card. If I have some instant to untap it and do it again. Um, Staff of Domination is a nice three drop. I don't quite have infinite mana in here, but for example, if I have a Thrawn Dynamo and a Guild of Lotus out, I can pay one and five to draw a card, and every spell I cast is going to net me a card. Um, of course, that's a lot of mana to just draw one card, but Staff of Domination is a good card here. Um, intensive and kind of a win more in most situations, but definitely worth this place. Now we have a single non-mana rock that produces mana. This is to help us fix our colors. This is also going to be replaced. Uh, this deck is going to turn into more of a high tide deck. It does not have high tide, but I do have the candelabra. But for the time being, this is used to fix the colors. Uh, then we have the mana rocks. We have all the super good ones that come out super fast. We have the crypt and the mox and the mox. I do need a mox diamond. That is another card I will eventually collect for this deck. We have the Mana Vault and the Soul Ring. Felwar Stone is fantastic as it comes into play untapped. We have the three Signets. And while they are not uh, competitive or ideal, since they do not come into play untapped, I love my diamonds. It's just a personal preference. 7th edition foil diamonds always make me all happy. <laughs> so of course I run them here. We have a Chromatic Lantern to help fix colors. Most importantly, it taps for blue. Um, it's just a nice 3-drop. This is what uh, an option that the Trophy Mage can get. 
then we have the Thrawn Dynamo, which sometimes is not necessary um, because it just has for colorless, but it does actually work well with the Candelabra. And then we have the Guild Lotus, which is the best Man Rock in the deck, something I like to clone if possible. Uh, again, I don't have High Tide, but we do have an actual factual Candelabra here. This is essentially a color fixer if I don't have a Mana Doubler. But again, since the win conditions of the deck may require two blue for that cap size, and if I don't have any kind of Mana Rock that taps for blue, this will do it for me. And let's go through the lands to finish the deck. Uh, there's a few things that I know will be changing here shortly. There are 36 lands currently. So we have the Command Tower and a Reflecting Pool and a, a Tap Land. This, for competitive reasons, this sh should not be in here. This should just be off-color fetch lands. But I'm only running the on-color fetch lands due to vanity. We have a Tarnished Citadel. The three on-color fetch lands. we got the Delta, the Mire, and the Scalding Tarn. We have the three Shock Lands. Again, I don't even have uh, duels. I'm not fond of playing duels in EDH, the financial investment, that is. If I'm going to invest in dual lands, I might as well be playing Legacy, where that's kind of required. The percent change in competitiveness and efficiency when adding three dual lands to this deck is not going to uh, really change that many games. Uh, we have the two Tango lands, because I can fetch them with the, shock, or the fetch lands. We have the three Filter lands. And now these three legendary lands are actually placeholders. And I plan on putting three more islands in their place because again, this is going to turn more high tide. We have an herb to fix all the black mana issues we have, ancient tomb for some fast mana, and the basics, a handful of islands. The issue here is I do have four mountains in this deck. I will most likely replace two mountains with more islands. We have a, I think five or six Swamps and the rest are planes. These are my favorite little Odyssey little shinies with a beautiful artwork on here. But yeah, this is my Kess slash Gwendolyn deck currently. If you are familiar with my channel, you know I have a sick passion for Gwendolyn. Of course, she, she is a whore. Yes, that is legitimately what she is. <laughs> but uh, competitively, Kess is a fantastic and very strong commander, specifically for this kind of deck. I mean, she's strong for basically any kind of combo build, spell-based build, Grixis deck. You can literally just put a bunch of counter spells and permission and thought seizes and head to Torox and tutor up a like a Rune Channer's Pike and kill someone with her. Like, <laughs> she's really good. <laughs> um, we got any ideas, feedback. I am always welcome. This is, of course, a deck I am slowly working on improving. Again, this started as an Inala, essentially the pre-con plus Paradox Engine plus Wizards, and it has evolved. Um, my Inala deck is more of a fun wizard deck, it's more casual, this is the stronger route. I noticed that the Inala deck had become a stronger competitive deck. Everyone, uh, due to the Laboratory Maniacs uh, channel, uh, has started making Inala combo decks using reanimation and whatnot, which is very good. That's very strong. So as soon as I saw people commonly building Anala as a competitive deck. I changed mine to be Paradox Engine. It was still rather strong, uh, and I didn't think Anala was ideal, so this is why we're here. But, again, any ideas, feedback, anything, I'm always welcome. Thanks.